On January the 28th, 1986, the world watched in horror as the televised launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger ended in tragedy when the ship broke apart just 73 seconds later, killing everyone on board. To this day, it remains one of the worst space accidents in history. When the Challenger launched in 1986, there were seven people on board who had been tasked with deploying a large communications orbital satellite to monitor Halley's Comet, retrieving a payload specialist from the International Space Station, and launching the Teacher in Space project. The astronauts on board were Gregory Jarvis, an engineer and payload specialist for Hughes Aircraft on the Challenger mission, Ellison Onizuka, an engineer, mission specialist, and the first Asian-American and person of Japanese origin to reach space. He was posthumously promoted to the rank of colonel. Michael Smith, the pilot for the Challenger. His voice was the last heard on the voice recorder for the shuttle. He was posthumously promoted to the rank of captain. Francis R. Dick Scobie, an engineer and combat aviator in the Vietnam War. He was the commander for the Challenger. Ronald McNair, an engineer and mission specialist, he was internationally recognized in the field of laser physics and the second ever African-American in space. If the Challenger's flight had been successful, McNair would have recorded a solo on his saxophone, the first original song in space. Judith Resnick, recognized as intellectually brilliant at a young age, she was recruited by NASA when she was just 28 and developed software and procedures for NASA missions. She was the first ever Jewish woman in space and a mission specialist on Challenger. S. Krista McAuliffe, a teacher and the first civilian in space. McAuliffe beat out 11,000 other contestants to win a position on Challenger for the Teacher in Space project. The intention was that she would perform the first ever lesson from space. The Challenger mission was only the second time NASA had assigned two women to the same crew. Although initially intended to launch in July 1985, the mission was delayed twice, eventually launching on January the 28th, 1986. On the day of the launch, temperatures hit a record low and NASA engineers became concerned over the effect the weather would have on the SRB, Shuttle Rocket Booster, O-rings. Shuttle Rocket Boosters are the extra bit of oomph a shuttle needs to launch into space. They work with the main engine rockets to give a short boost of high-pressure fuel for the first part of the space journey, before breaking away from the rest of the rocket at approximately 24 miles in the air. The SRBs are what provided the majority of the thrust at liftoff, and the O-ring is the circular gasket that seals the booster and prevents the high-pressure gases from escaping. As far back as 1977, issues had been identified with the O-rings and raised as concerns amongst the engineers of NASA and Morton Thiokol, the independent manufacturer of the SRBs. Morton Thiokol had even started a redesign of their casings that they intended to launch the following year. Yet, they still allowed the older model to be used in flight, believing it to be totally fine for launch. This was despite many words of warning to the contrary. Just a day before the launch on January the 27th, the manager of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the launch was taking place, set up a conference call to discuss safety concerns. Morton Thiokol engineers expressed concerns, believing they didn't have enough data to confirm whether the O-rings would still seal at such low temperatures, and both the Vice President of Engineering and Vice President of Space Booster Programs at Morton Thiokol recommended delaying the launch until the weather grew warmer. What happened next changed the course of spaceflight history and resulted in the Challenger's almost inevitable fate. After a brief recess, the leaders at Morton Thiokol returned to the conference call with complete changes of heart, claiming evidence of the dangers were insubstantial and the launch should proceed as planned. We don't know what happened in those brief few minutes that made them change their minds, but when NASA's SRB project manager, Lawrence Malloy, called the NASA mission management team leader, Arnold Aldrich, to convey this news, he failed to mention the O-ring discussion preceding the decision. On January the 28th, the engineers awoke to more troubling issues with the Challenger. Overnight temperatures had hit the predicted low, and the SRBs were recorded at temperatures of minus 4 and minus 13 degrees centigrade. Arnold Aldrich, 
consulted with engineers at the Kennedy and Johnson Space Centers and concluded the ice didn't threaten the safety of the launch. The Challenger was cleared to begin its journey at 11.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time when the air temperature was just 2 degrees centigrade. It was the failure of the SRB's O-rings that was later determined to be the fault of the Challenger's short-lived flight. Most major TV networks streamed the launch, and, due to the presence of teacher Krista McAuliffe aboard the Challenger, live streams were piped into thousands of classrooms across America. The nation's children got a front-row seat to the horror that happened next. As the world watched on, the Challenger seemingly became engulfed in flames, causing most major channels to quickly cut the footage. Minutes later, they would release broadcasts of the Challenger's destruction, just 73 seconds after takeoff. The cabin that contained the crew free fell back to Earth at 200 miles per hour, crash landing in the Atlantic Ocean. Tragically, later evidence uncovered that the crew did not die in the initial explosion. Although some of them may have been unconscious, Onizuka and Resnick's personal egress air packs were activated, as was the pilot's, Smith's. But Smith's activation switch was on the back of his seat, suggesting one of the other two helped him to activate it. Controls that could not have been moved in any other way than by Smith were found to have been switched during the freefall, indicating his futile attempt to restore power to the engines. Sadly, their efforts weren't enough for them to survive the disaster. The Challenger launch marks one of the saddest days in American history. Immediately after the disaster, President Ronald Reagan, who was scheduled to give the State of the Union address that evening, instead spoke to the nation about the Challenger, live from the Oval Office. It was the first time in history that the address had been postponed. But Reagan's shorter, heartfelt message about the disaster is now considered one of the president's greatest speeches. As a result of the Challenger disaster, the Space Shuttle program was put on hold for the next two and a half years, and the Rogers Commission was formed on February 6, 1986, to investigate exactly what went wrong. Both the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, and the first American woman in space, Sally Ride, were members. The Commission's report was damning, blaming both NASA and Morton Thiokol for the tragedy. They determined the cause of the accident to be the Wright SRB's O-rings, just as the engineers had feared and warned about 24 hours before launch. They claimed Morton Thiokol and NASA's poor management and poor safety culture were to blame for these concerns being dismissed and published a list of recommendations to make spaceflight safe again. Although lots of new changes occurred at NASA in the years after the disaster, for the seven aboard the Challenger, these remedies were too late. They are remembered to this day as American heroes, buried together in Section 46 of Arlington Cemetery, with the Space Shuttle Challenger Memorial standing over the grave. A famous aeronautical poem, High Flight, by John Gillespie McGee Jr., etched into the back. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never a lark or ever eagle flew. And, while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Like this video? Don't forget to like and subscribe for more historical content.